You wouldn't be the first. In fact, if you Googled that exact phrase, you'd find almost 300 million hits. And even before the digital age, the worldwide tapestry of religion reflected that same dilemma. But the quest to know God is not one-sided. People might want to know about God, but God even more certainly wants to reveal himself to them. In fact, he's displayed himself in what he created since the beginning of time. And on top of that, he wrote an autobiography and then made sure it was a bestseller. So who is God? That's certainly not a question that we can answer completely. But the Bible provides enough insight to answer it sufficient. He is Father, Savior, King, Friend, Owner, and Provider. And if we can understand even that much, our lives will never be the same. Well, good morning. Hello. Hello, Apple Valley. Hello, Keelan. Hello, Classic. Hello, Victorville. Uh, lovely weekend here in the desert. I'm very glad that you're here with us. We'd love to give you some notes. There's a lot of different scripture references this weekend that we won't get to all of them, but they'd be great for you to have as the days go by, maybe even for your small group. So you put a hand up, we'll bring them, and we'll slide them right to you, nice and discreetly, okay? The, uh, the furloughs haven't affected our wonderful volunteer team here at HTC, and they will still provide service. Now, with that said, yay for our volunteers. Um, uh, with, I know it got awkward, like, do we clap or not? <laughs> um, with that said, we're going to continue in our series, Who is God? And over the last few weeks, we've looked at some things that Scripture says about who He is, word pictures, and we tried to unpack some of the meaning from those ideas. And over the course of those weeks, there have actually been big theological terms that we've been able to share with you throughout the explanation of these uh, topics. For example, the fact when Tom talked us through uh, God is king, his sovereignty, the fact that God is omnipotent, he has all power. The fact that we talk through God as friend, and even though he is high, he is also near, that God is all places in all times, that is his omnipresence. We talked through the fact that God is Father and He's able to guide us in life, that He knows all things. He's omniscient. Today's topic, there's no omni word for it. It just kind of lays out there and there's no theological term that's been assigned to it. And so I want to let you know that first of all, it is an idea that is pervasive across Scripture. It's a lot of places, which is why there's a lot of Scripture. We're going to get to some of those passages. Some of them we will reference from a distance. Some of them will just be written in your notes that you can go back to. Because not only is this topic not assigned a theological word, um, it's also a topic that we don't love. <laughs> and sorry about that. Build a bridge and um, deal with it. But we need to move through this topic because it is important to us as a people. It is important to who God is. And so you need to know that. The second thing you need to know is this, that I have pet peeve, okay? Um, I have pet peeve when people email or text or, I don't know, blog, uh, that there is a difference between you are and your, and they are and their, okay? Those things bug me. And um, I, there is a Bible pet peeve that I have uh, that is the book of Revelation, not Revelations. However, um, maybe uh, me made a mistake and in your notes when we get there eventually it's going to say Revelations chapter 5 you are better than me and I know that you're going to notice that and you're going to write it on your welcome form or you're going to email me um, just let's all just breathe it out right now Pastor Tim made a huge giant mistake and I'm very sorry about that you are right I am wrong you're better than me I'm worse than you <sighs> it's still going to make my skin crawl when we get to it because when we, I fixed it in this, but I couldn't fix all 8,000 copies of the paper by the time I discovered it. So my bad. Okay, let's move on. <laughs> Our topic this weekend is this, is that God is owner. Leave your notes closed because the passage is going to be there on the front. You might want to jot something down um, concerning it. But God is owner. And now you're instantly wondering, like, okay, what was this topic that we're, there's no theological word for? There's no word for this. He's not omnoner. He's not omnitidal deed, lean releaser. He's, he's just, God is owner. He owns all things. And in the same way he has all power, knows all things, is in all places, 
We look at this title of God is owner in the same way. He possesses all things. But in a weird way, I think sometimes when we look at the fact that God has all strength or all knowledge, it almost distances him from us. It almost makes it so that I don't even, I don't even understand exactly what that means. So what we will do today is we will try and get from the broad down to the specific We will also make mention that God's ownership over all things is different than your ownership of things. Matter of fact, this first passage that we will read right now is from the lips of a king. A king has a lot of stuff. They've got a lot of property and a lot of people and a lot of possessions. A king has got a lot of goodness. But as he begins to describe what God owns, it's different because God is self-sufficient. He's self-sustaining. He's apart from what you and I would think of in terms of ownership. The things I own, I need. I need my car to get to work. I need my food so that I can eat. I need my TV so that when I'm tired, my kids will be babysat by electronics. I I need, I'm sorry, did I say that too bluntly? (laughs) I, I need the things I have so that I can continue to exist. And I know that there are things that you and I own that are luxury items, but even those things add to the value of our lives, okay? God's possessions don't add to his value. He is worth infinite amount of concepts or knowledge apart from these things. And so it actually makes it very interesting, then why does God possess anything? And I think over our time today, you'll begin to see that there is a direction, a reason that God owns things. But enough, there's the end when we get there. Let's talk about 1 Chronicles chapter 29. Um, Verse 10 just says that David is speaking. It's so that you understand that a king is making mention of these things. But verse 11 begins to describe what God owns. So let's skip into 11. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. Indeed, everything that is in the heavens and the earth, yours is the dominion, O Lord. And you exalt yourself as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. And in your hand is power and might, and it lies in your hand to make great and strengthen everyone. There are whispers in this opening passage of what we will conclude with. Now, therefore, our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. David a king, David a man of wealth, David a man who at once was poor, at once worked for even food, now has anything and everything he needs. But when he stops and when he describes God, he says, God, you've got everything. As a matter of fact, you've got everything so sufficiently, so adequately that you hold them in your hand. My son recently saved up and bought a basketball, and he's eight. He's a third grader, and I, I was trying to coach him. I didn't want him to buy a, a, a women's basketball because he'd take offense to that, but it's a little smaller. I wanted him to maybe think about like one of those kids-sized basketball, but no, he wasn't having it. He wanted the full adult, what does Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant play basketball with basketball. That's the kind of basketball I need, Dad. And I'm like, okay, here it is. And you know, when little kids play with a big basketball, they got to dribble it with both hands. That's different than what David is describing here. David says, consider the total sum of all things. Heavens, the earth, dominion, power, glory, wealth. God's got it all here. That is the level of sufficiency he's able to hold things with. And now this passage would be adequate for us to understand the fact that God holds all things, but even, even that illustration actually, I think, challenges our understanding of it because it's, and I'm, I'm sorry I say this, it's too bible God hath all dominion and doth reign upon yonder hills forever and ever. It's like, I, okay, that's a good thing to say. It's a good thing to ascribe. I would sing that. I would believe it, but I don't even, I, I need to get it. And so I want to explore the extent of the ownership of God with you guys for a few moments, if I could. So could you write this down on the inside of your notes? Could you write down that the angelic host is his? We'll begin to describe for you in greater detail what God owns. And this first reality is the angelic host is his. Have you ever walked into someone else's living room and, let's be honest, you didn't know them that well and you were getting to know them and you made judgment calls about who they were based on what was in their living room, okay? Because our living rooms reflect 
at least in portion what we're worth. Sorry, it's the way it is. And so there's furniture, there's decorations, and there's electronics in most people's living rooms, okay? And you walk in and you quickly begin to assess. If you are a lady, you are assessing the decorations in, in the home you're in, aren't you? And you're trying to judge, are like, is this Kirkland grade decorations? Is this Pottery Barn grade decorations? Oh, <laughs> Craigslist grade decorations, okay. <laughs> you quickly begin to, and let's be fair, you know, a lot of us, I don't know when in life you're allowed to have nice furniture because right now I could actually afford nicer furniture than the furniture I have. There's just no point, okay? I got two dogs and four kids. I might as well just fill up sacks with peanuts and just call that our furniture. I don't know what age you're allowed to have nicer stuff. But sometimes we gauge the niceness of the furniture. That typically tells us maybe the life stage they're in more than anything. And, and the gentlemen, we walk in and we look at the TV, don't we? Huh. What you got there, 40, 42? Is that a 46? What is that, a 50? Is that a 55? You got a 60-inch? Whoa, what is that, a 72-inch? We're gauging the TV, aren't we? That's what we notice. We're sizing up the value, the worth of the people based on what we see. And it's so funny, too, because when other people come into your home, you always make a determining call like, am I going to like apologize for the niceness of my stuff or try and talk it up a little bit based on who came into your home? John, in the book of Revelation, that God gave him a single revelation, John is drawn into the throne room of God. And in the fifth chapter, John is recalling what he saw there, a number of things. And he's trying to give words to what he saw. And this is an interesting sentence. In verse 11 of chapter 5, he says that he saw murios kai murios, kai kilios kai kilios of angels. And it is these two Greek words that he's trying to convey. Now, kilios means thousand. And kilios kai kilios could mean thousands and thousands, or it could also very easily mean thousands times thousands, okay? Now, if you're good at math, a thousand times a thousand is a million. Murios kai murios is different. Murios kai murios, some of your Bibles, the English word, they just put myriad. Myriads and myriads of angels. Some of them... They, in the, in the range of ways you could translate that word, you, you could also say that um, like 10,000, okay? It, it's this massive group. 10,000 times 10,000 is 100 million. John is trying to write down what he saw, and he's like, dude, there was like a million, no, that's not right. There's like 100 million angels in the presence of God. You walk into that, and you are impressed this is not the extent of the angelic world. These are the angels who dwell in the very presence of God. Because the Bible explains in other places in the book of Daniel that there are angels who are out doing battle against the demonic, satanic forces in the heavenlies. In the book of Hebrews, there are angels who are sent to minister to those who are inheriting salvation, is the phrase used. In the Gospel of Luke, there are angels who are God's communicators, and they carry messages from God back to his people. You see, the angelic world is massive, and even when one of us was allowed to see it, he still didn't even understand the scope of it. It is this unseen world in large part to us. And even when we are given glimpses into that world through the eyes of God's beloved disciple John, he's like, I don't know, there was a million, a hundred million? I don't even know, fool. There was a lot of angels. That was a lot. God owns those. Those are his possession. And it's okay to be impressed with the ownership of God. But let's step smaller. Let's get out of the unseen world. Let's step into the known world. The universe is his. Deuteronomy chapter 10 says that the heavens belong to God. We call it the universe. And Pastor Tom has made mention before that really at this point, scientists call it the observable universe. Because at this point, we don't even really know how far it goes. We're trying to get a grasp on what we have been able to see either with our own naked eye, which was at one point overwhelming, and then we started poking a little further 
Thank you, Galileo, Copernicus, Kepler, some of these other guys who've looked further into the heavens. And by the way, I will say this until the day I die. Let the world of science chase down knowledge, guys, because they look into the handiwork of God. They're trying to assign a label to it that's fine, but goodness sakes, don't be afraid of modern science, okay? And they look now with these massive telescopes. Hubble, shoot, that is outdated and old. They're gearing up with new ways to peer further into the heavens. Let's talk about the value of heaven. Not of heaven, but of the heavens. Fossil fuels. You drove here in a car today. You helped hurdle us as a civilization towards the edge of a cliff when we're going to run out of stuff to burn, okay? Just the way it is. That is. I'm not a doomsday. I don't know if it's 50 years from now or 5,000. I really don't. But it makes logical sense that at one point we will deplete some of our natural resources, all right? And so there is a look to the heavens for the answer of what comes next for energy. Not in prayer, but for solar energy, right? And, and there is skeptics and optimists about what solar energy holds. But really, our skepticism doesn't ever revolve around the sun. It always revolves around in our ability to make a technology that is sustainable, right? It's like, are the panels worth the money? Are they long-term? Can we change that into electricity efficiently. It, the, the skepticism revolves around what we can do with it, not what it is. And you consider the fact that the sun is strong enough to have held your grandparents, you, your grandchildren, every day in its orbit at a distance that both warms you, that grows plants that now oxygenate the air. I mean, our sun is a remarkable source of energy. And you, th okay, let's assign a value to the depleting fossil fuels that we're using. There's billions of dollars still left in that, right? Well, now imagine, gosh, well, what could we do with this seemingly permanent source of energy in our sun? I mean, how many billions? We're past billions. We're into the trillions now. If you could figure out that in a way that it makes good business sense, shoot, this sun is worth trillions of dollars. You know that our sun is just one star in our galaxy, right? And you know our galaxy is just a galaxy in a host of galaxies, right? I don't even, you, you can't do the spreadsheet, you can't do the cost projection analysis. There is no way for us to come up with a figure to explain the value of the heavens. That the observable universe possesses so much that God says, yeah, I got that. That's what I got. And so I know that there have been people in our past and people in our future who will own a lot. And we shrink back against these Middle Eastern men who own so much. Oh, I'm so uncomfortable with the fact that they own so much. Really? Because I'm real comfortable with the fact that I know someone who owns a lot more energy than them. He, he owns the universe. It's his. But even that isn't really comprehensible. It's like, I don't, I don't get that. I, it's a neat thing to listen to, but the smallest given illustration in scripture about what God owns is the earth. The earth is his. Matter of fact, Psalm chapter 24 begins with that idea that the earth belongs to God. And fortunately, Bible study in the History Channel give us at least an approachable sense of what God owns. Because a couple months ago, the History Channel ran a special called What the Earth is Worth. Anyone watch the History Channel? Yay for the nerds, yay. <laughs> I sat down with my boys and we watched it a couple months back. And it's fascinating. It tallied up the current American dollar value for the Earth's natural resources. Not businesses and currencies of governments. Natural resources. Base metals, precious metals, stone, timber, water, food, fossil fuels, natural resources. And it came up with this number. And at the end of the special, it drops this big number on you. And you're like, I don't even get that. <laughs> but it's this massive number that is just under seven quadrillion dollars. Okay? And I'm like, oh, Matt. Because Matt's my friend here at work. And I'm like, Matt. The, I want a slide, and I want a slide that explains what in the world this number really means. And he's like, I don't know what that number means. I'm like, neither do I. we got to figure it out. And he's like, well, I think if we just put that number on the screen, no one's really, it's going to like immediately excuse them from having to understand what that number is. So we got to figure out a way to explain what the earth is worth. All right, let's figure it out. The world's most wealthy man right now actually goes back and forth between Warren Buffett 
Bill Gates, and a dude um, named Carlos, okay, Carlos Lim Elu. And these three guys bounce back and forth based on, you know, net holdings and blah, stuff I obviously don't understand because I'm not on that list. And uh, Bill Gates right now is, like today, is worth about $60 billion, okay? I know, <laughs> super discouraging. <laughs> Let's say that you want to catch up to him to help us understand what God owns. If you are able to have a Ramsey envelope and save every year one million dollars, okay? <laughs> and you are able to, first of all, that's a hefty envelope. You are able to save a million dollars every year. You know how long it's going to take you to catch him, right? 60,000 years. I hate church today. <laughs> and, and at that point, now 60,000 years from now, you've caught up to Bill. To get to what the earth's natural resources are worth, you have to make that figure. Every year, you can no longer take 60,000 years to get to that. It's going to take, I can't even explain that. You have to have that much money every year. Your sales can't drop off. You can't depreciate in value a dime, not a cent. You have to make that much money every year for 114,000 years. That's the current net value of the natural resources of the earth. And God says, yeah, that's the smallest thing I could even explain to you what I own. Because I've got the heavenlies that you don't see. I own the heavens which you can kind of see. I own the earth and all that is in it is mine. And you stress when we talk about ownership. Your chest tightens when it's that time in church to talk about what God owns and what we own. Your knuckles turn white as you grab a hold, grasping at the straws that you got in your own bank account. How much money do you got in your bank account? Is this seven quadrillion dollars? No, it is not. It is time for you to turn off your stress, at least when we speak about the subject. It is time for this topic to be the sort of thing that like, whew, you know what? I actually would rather talk about this than avoid the topic. I would like to rest in the ownership that my king has. Because man, it sure seems like, and I, all of them, Fox, CNN, MSNBC, I don't care. All of them like to play the doomsday card with us. All of them do. And they are all playing the doomsday card with us. So ironically, they're saying that we're going to run out of money so they can make money off of you. It's ironic to me. And we allow our hearts to be pressed, to be crushed, to be shaped, to be given conviction by other people who are fearful that the sky is falling. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. I don't know. But all I know is scripture is trying to say God owns things. As a matter of fact, God owns all things. And I know we don't have a big fancy word for it. But the scriptures say in a number of places, there's an awful lot I left on the cutting room floor this week because Bible, the Bible is clear. God owns all things. And I think it's the sort of thing that can settle our hearts. And I think it's the sort of thing that can give our hearts direction. I think it's the sort of thing that can give our hearts some healthy conviction. Because at the end of all these things, when we come back next week and Tom talks us through the implication of it, that's the big, that's the monster at the end of the book, Grover. That's the man behind the curtain, wizard. It's the big, scary secret is that what God wants with all of this is actually the sort of thing that should give you peace. But I'm saying the end, and we're not there yet. Let's talk about some of the implications of the fact that God owns all things. The first implication is that God has an interest in his world. That is maybe a nice, simple place to begin. God has an interest in this world. Now this is fascinating because again, God doesn't own things so that he can sustain himself, so that he doesn't like go hungry or that he doesn't run out of money. God owns things for a different reason. And the first thing that we'll see is that God simply has an interest in what he owns. In the Gospel of Luke, the 20th chapter, Jesus tells a story and he uses um, a, a commodity to explain something about God. And he says, there's this um, dude, and he owns a vineyard, and he, he establishes it, and he has some uh, people come in and tend to the vineyard. They are the growers, the people who work in the vineyard. And he leaves, and as he is away, he begins to send people back to check on the vineyard. 
Well, the people who've been left behind in this story of Jesus have grown so attached to the vineyard. They've grown so possessive of the vineyard that when someone is sent to check on it, they beat them. And the owner's like, whoa, cray, cray, what happened there? I'll send someone else to check on the vineyard. And so he sends another person to check on the vineyard. Same thing happened. They beat him within an inch of his life. And the owner of the vineyard is confused at this point. He's like, I don't, I don't even know what's happening because it's my vineyard. It's my stuff. It sustains them and I'm checking on it. And so I know what I'll do. And in the story, the owner of the vineyard sends his son. And Jesus says, because if they see that I sent my son, that will for sure tell them how interested I am in what I possess. Except what happened when God sent his son into the world. The religious leaders were so possessive of the attention that they got from the Jewish people. They were so tight-fisted and, and white-knuckled about what they had, that they beat his son to death, didn't they? Jesus tells the story, fair enough, the purpose of it in the Gospel of Luke is to prick the ears and hearts of the religious leaders of the day. But it also assumes something, doesn't it? It assumes that God has an interest in what he owns. And I think it's interesting to us, or to me, that we don't have a developed sense of conviction that God is interested in, in the things in this world. And I'm going to use an illustration that I went back and forth on. Uh, but I'm going to speak about the first thing to draw reference to the second. Okay? Um, in recent days, in our culture, something has floated to the surface in conservative circles um, over the issue of gun control. And it has fleshed out a very developed, a very passionate, expressed conviction about the area of gun rights. And a lot of people in our own desert, we drove past, at least I did, a week ago, um, we assign the idea that my passion, my hobby, my pursuit, that's fine, there's nothing wrong with it, I'm not making a judgment call about this, but we say that it is my God-given right to own a gun and use it responsibly and safely. Listen, I've gone shooting, my boys love guns, they turn everything into a gun, they pick up their two-year-old sister and shoot each other with her, okay? <laughs> this isn't about that. I think it's fascinating that we have developed a deep well of conviction over an area that is not in scripture. Guns are not in scripture, the gun rights is not there, okay? And then now let's walk over to the cupboard and check on how much conviction you've developed over the years in the area of God's ownership over things. Because it sure seems like we have got more excuses in that cupboard than anything. Whoa, there have been, there's been lots of people who've just abused us and it's all about them getting rich. And it's all, uh, yeah, you know what, there have been, you're right. There have been a couple people in, our, in the history of our culture who've abused this truth and turned it into the fact that they want to make a buck. You're right. I'm not going to name names because I don't even want to judge their hearts and maybe there's more good in them than bad. I don't know. But honestly, it's not a lot. Honestly, there are more scripture references that develop the idea that God has an interest in what he owns. And I think it's fascinating that in this area that scripture is relatively silent about, we have a deep, passionate conviction over this idea. Dude, if there's anyone in the room that's all for deep, passionate conviction, it's me. And then we walk over here and we look at the idea of does God have an interest in the things of this world? Is he peering in and checking on what he watch or that he owns? Why is this pantry empty? But we got a deep well over here. I don't think it's quite right. Ugh, it's uncomfortable. I'm sorry. I know you now wishing that we skip an hour ahead right now. Sorry. We gotta keep moving. God has expectations for his world. You can write that down as well. If God is an owner, then it's fair that he has an interest in what he owns. As a matter of fact, it's very fair, it's even wise, that he has expectations for what he owns. Now, the reference here is from 1 Corinthians. The city of Corinth had a lot of money passed through that city. It was a, a city that things were traded through. And people with a lot would come there, and people there that lived there would make a lot based on the trade. And so Paul is now writing to these believers in a city that was acquainted with wealth, all right? 
And he says in the third chapter, hey, I know that you're very aware of business practices and that there are certain things you do in business to accumulate things for yourself. Good. That is good. I need you to understand that so that you get this next idea. Your life will be judged by God. Paul, <laughs> what? No. We're Christians. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. It's, it's cool. God has saved me and that's the end of it. Yeah, correct. Absolutely yes. He references that Jesus is the foundation that supports your salvation. Period. No one will ever argue that. But then, you need to know, put on your big boy pants, your life will be judged by God. What do you mean my life will be judged by God? I, what do you mean, what do I mean? Your life, you, will be judged whack, by God. Oh, that's, that's the most straightforward I could say it. And he says, well, let me explain it this way. You guys are familiar with precious stones, silver, and gold, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those things are nice, right? Yeah, yeah, those are nice. Are you familiar with hay and stubble and straw? Yeah, 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 those things are stupid. Okay, good. What you do with the things God has given you is kind of like those two categories. And if you do well with those things, it's like gold, silver, and precious stones. If you don't do well with what God has given you, it's like wood, hay, and stubble. And the judgment, let's explain it like this. There's a fire that will test the quality of your work. And let me tell you, straw, stubble, and hay don't last too long. But those things that are valuable pass right through. Matter of fact, it shines them right up. I, I don't know what to tell you other than the fact that Paul was trying to be very clear. Later in the gospel, or excuse me, in the epistle, he's writing to them and he's, he's now trying to pull their sexual lives into focus in a walk with God. And he's trying to say, you know what? Your sexuality should represent a faithfulness that God has and a purity that God has. Like sex is designed by God for lots of reasons, but one of them is that you are communicating his character through the way you use your sexual lives. And he uses this phrase in the seventh chapter in the 23rd verse. He says, you were bought at a price. He reminds us of our own purchase. Because really we could spend the whole day speaking of the fact that God owns you in a way that is honoring, in a way that is protective, in a way that is secure. And he, he expresses that expectation that he has on your lives. Let me ask you about your stuff. And I don't want your stuff. You can keep your stuff. But let me ask you about it. Do you have something that is nice? You probably have one thing that is nice. And it is not nicer than everything everyone else has, but it's, you know, your truck. It's just a good truck. Or, and I'm sorry, ladies. I always talk about cars. It's your Bernina sewing machine. And it's a nice machine, okay? My wife has a Bernina sewing machine. And something went out on it. I'm like, well, let's just buy you a new one. She's like, no, this is a Bernina. And I'm like, my bad. <laughs> and let me ask you, the, the nice thing that you have, you know stuff about it, don't you? You know what it's able to do, huh? You know in that Bernina machine, the 8100, the needle. Man, it's... Let's talk about cars. <laughs> <laughs> you know the displacement of your engine and the cylinders and the horsepower and the torque and you know what it's able to do. Either the amount it can tow or the speed it can achieve. You know about it, don't you? Because when you thought, I'm going to spend money on these shoes or this sewing machine or this truck, you had already researched ahead of time, if I'm going to invest this much money in something, I need it to do something. I need it to be able to do what I want it to do. And if I'm going to buy something in this world that is actually nice, that is actually reflects my passion, I have expectations for it. And if I actually go out of my way and spend more money on this object than I would have on a normal object, I have expectations for it. That is wise. That is logical. Good for you. Why do we shrink back, our t chest tighten, our knuckles grow white when God says, Hey, I have expectations over the things that I own. I have a deep sense of investment and care in this world. And there are certain things that I need to achieve through what I possess. 
Why in the world do we recoil from that idea? It makes every ounce of sense in the world to me. It is very logical. As a matter of fact, if he is a good king, a good father, a good savior, then I'm glad the fact that he's interested in what he possesses. I'm very glad that he has expectations because I'm part of what he possesses. And this is the big, hairy, scary secret. Here's what God would say to us is that he's asked us to manage his stuff. That's it. There is a fantastic passage that I'm about to read to you. But it's interesting to hear Paul explain there's a difference between lame stuff and nice stuff. And what you do in this world matters. It will carry over. But then Peter, when he's describing your salvation, he says, you know you were bought with something that's pretty valuable. And not something stupid like gold. But with the most rare element, the rare commodity that our world has ever seen. And I know there's a difference of opinion in Christian minds about the age of the earth. But we all would believe that it, 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 God is the creator. And about 2,000 years ago, for 33-ish years, the only time in the history of our world there existed divine, sinless blood. And there was a finite amount. It was the only time that existed in the person of Christ. And Peter says, you were bought, you were redeemed, with the blood of Jesus. It was at high cost that you've been bought. Apparently you're worth more than you give yourself credit for. And with that in mind, I want to close with this passage. When God now begins to speak about our possessions, and you might actually be very surprised what he has to say. Chapter 50 in the collection of the Psalms, says this, I have no need of a bull from your stall or of goats from your pens. For every animal of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird in the mountains and the insects in the fields are mine. If I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you, for the earth is mine and all that is in it. You see, when you are willing to now let go of your anxiety of, the to of this topic, if you're willing to not be so possessive, you might be real shocked to hear that God doesn't need your stuff. I love the fact that he's saying in this passage, I don't need your bulls. I don't need your goats, dude. I don't need another goat, all right? I got cattle on a thousand hills. I don't need your stuff. Matter of fact, birds in the mountains that you can't even get to, those are mine. The bugs in the field that you don't even know about, those are mine. You know, right, that scientists still don't even know how many types of bugs there are. How many types of bugs there are. We ain't going to start talking about bugs, don't worry. But God says, fool, I don't need your stuff. This isn't about me at a telethon asking you to please maybe $10 a month. Could you do something? No, that's not what this is about. Now, why would he say that? Well, because in the Jewish system of worship, you brought a bull or a goat or a pigeon or a dove to worship God. Out of the extent of your worth, you would bring something to worship his worth. And at this point, he's saying, hey, wait a second. Why are you freaking out? Why are you cramming your wallet deeper? Why are you not willing to give a ride in your car to someone to work who has no more car? Why are you freaking out about hosting a Bible study in your living room? Why are you worried about writing a check for a mission trip? I don't need your stuff. I don't need any of it. Because I've got more stuff than you know. Pastor Tim tried this week to do some math, and he couldn't explain to you how much I've got. And I love the phrase he uses. If I were hungry, I don't even need a sandwich from you, bro. Keep your Cheetos. That's fine. <laughs> For the earth is mine and all that is in it. If I want your stuff, I will take it. I really don't need your janky stuff. Well, then what's this all about? What, what do I do with this? I mean, God is king. I'm a servant. He's father. I'm his kid. He's a savior, I'm a sinner. I get all those. What's my response then? What do I have to take away from this? 
Could it just simply be that God wants you to be as invested in the things he's invested in? Could it just, could it just be that he just wants you to manage his stuff? I mean, is this idea terrifying or is it not? Is that kind of like, ah, man, I guess I was bought at a price. And I never really, I don't know, I just, I just kind of thought that those TV preachers, they just want to get rich off my stuff. I don't, I, don't, I don't want your bulls and goats. Don't bring those to church next week. <laughs> God wants you to manage what he has. It's what you want with your kids. It's what you want with your employees. This makes sense. This is good. This should bring a believer's heart comfort, not anxiety. Because God has, he's at least good for seven quadrillion dollars. Okay? Probably more than that. And after he's expressed his ownership over all things, he begins to fire back and say, I, I'm, I'm not running a telephone here. What I want from you is to manage the things I have for the purpose I have them for. That's what I'm after. And so if you can get on board with what I want, that's all that really needs to happen with all of this. And I think, I mean, that's, I think that's, what we've been created for. I think it's our purpose to win people back to God and communicate to them that he spent an awful lot to buy them back. And if he wants to use our stuff to do it, it's probably a good idea for us to step in line. Let's pray. Father, I know that we have anxiety about this topic. And God, uh, I know that over the years, I've gone back and forth on how much faith I have that you own all things. But Father, I pray that you would impress on our hearts this weekend, you have so much stuff that we really don't need to worry about what you want with ours. God, thank you for telling me you don't need my things. And God, thank you for telling me that you own everything. And so, Father, I pray that you would help our church to grow in a conviction about your ownership. God, help us to maybe stock that pantry full of some ideas, scripture, beliefs. And, Father, I pray that it would mature us. And if you're here this weekend and your life hasn't been given to God, it's probably fair that you're nervous about what he owns and what you don't own. But maybe this is the first time you've ever heard the story of Jesus explained to you in the terms of a commodity, that his blood is the only blood who's ever been divine sinless. And that blood is able to buy you back to God. And for whatever reason today on this topic, your heart needs to respond. Would you please call out to God in this moment? At HDC, we explain it this way, that you need to tell God right now, you admit that you have sin. In a sense, you're bankrupt and that you know your sin has kept you from God, has kept you from heaven. And would you now please tell God that you believe that Jesus is more than a legend or a myth or just an Easter story, but that Jesus is God stepped into our world hung on a cross, and then defeats the grave. And would you please choose to give your life to him in this moment? The rest of us would rejoice. We would be proud that you would be given the same thing we've been given. But you need to choose today to follow him with your life. And God, we are grateful at the end of all things that out of your divine wealth, you step low. And God, then in your lowness, in your humility, you spend everything you had on us. God, thanks a ton for spending it all on us. Amen.